Welcome to Space Course, my name is Jeff, and today we're going to be taking a look at part one of two parts in the brief history of space rovers. It's so exciting how we got from Earth to the Moon to Venus to Mars and hopefully somewhere further. Asteroids, comets, that's awesome. So let's, let's talk about that today on Space Course. This past August marked five years of the Curiosity rover exploring and discovering the wonders of Mars. But what did it take to get there? What sacrifices were made in order to get such a large, sophisticated machine on another planet? Today we explore the history of rovers. Since the 1960s, the United States and the Soviet Union have been building expensive, sophisticated machines and just slamming them into planetary bodies. For real, just slamming them. Some missed their targets completely, while others were crushed like soda cans, and very, very few made it long enough to beam a signal of hope back home. So far, we've landed on nearby planets, faraway moons, and fast-moving asteroids. We've delivered stationary landers, exploratory rovers, and in one instance, an orbiter that was never really intended to land at all, touched down on another body. It's amazing! Now, to fully understand how we went from Earth to the Moon to Mars and beyond, we first need to understand how we began this great adventure, along with some of the history of planetary rovers. So let's begin all the way back in February of 1966 with the Soviet Union and Luna 9. This spacecraft was the first ever spacecraft to achieve a lunar soft landing and survive long enough to tell about it. Now, Luna 9 was technically the first soft landing of a craft on the Moon, although the landing really wasn't that soft at all. After initial impact, it bounced several times before coming to a stop in an area known as Oceanus Procellarum. Several minutes later, its four petal-shaped covers opened up and stabilized the spacecraft on the surface. Its onboard sensors consisted only of a radiation detector and a small upward-facing camera with a mirror that could point in 360 degree to get a full coverage of the, the lunar frontier. Luna 9 transmitted data to Earth in seven radio sessions totaling just more than eight hours. These transmissions included three series of TV pictures, the first ever taken from the moon's surface, as well as panoramic views of the, lo of the lunar landscape. Three days after the impact, the batteries died and Luna 9's mission was terminated, but despite its short duration, by simple virtue of landing on, on the moon, it settled something that was previously uncertain the lunar surface could support a spacecraft. Some believe at the time that the moon was, was far too soft to land anything at all, let alone a tiny little robot and eventually a human-sized spaceship. So Luna 9 not only placed a manned mission to the moon firmly within the realm of possibility, but also showed the world the possibilities of landing similar craft deeper into our solar system. A short four months later, the Surveyor missions were the first attempts by the United States to make soft landings on the moon. And five of the seven spacecraft proved American technology up to the task, including the very first one, Surveyor 1. The surveyors were originally intended to be their own standalone missions, but were quickly uh, taken over by the Apollo missions for kind of scout programs and, and things like that. As the space race heated up, they needed as much information about the moon as possible. Surveyor 1 marked the first soft landing for the United States on June 2nd, 1966. All seven spacecraft uh, served to validate NASA's ability to put spacecraft on a lunar intercept directory, make the proper maneuvers to, to place a spacecraft at a predetermined point in the lunar surface, and to communicate with mission control on Earth across quarter million miles. They also served as scouts for potential Apollo landing sites. All rovers served their purpose except for two and four, surveyors two and four. It's because they ultimately were crushed upon landing as well as five of the seven landing that's pretty good in unknown conditions, places, and with all new technology that was still untested. So now we fast forward a bit. By the time the United States had successfully landed a man on the moon, the Soviets launched a series of lunar rovers to the moon between 1969 and 1977 under the program heading of Lunokhod or Moonwalker. Excuse my Russian. The first Lunokhod didn't make it through launch, but the second renamed to Lunokhod 1 touched down on the, on the moon's Sea of Rains on November 17, 1970, aboard the spacecraft Luna 17. Though the Soviets had lost the race to the moon, they didn't let that stop them uh, and plan instead for a different first in Luna Cold 1. 
and would be the very first remote-controlled rover to land on another planetary body. Luna 17 dis uh, deposited Luna Cold 1 on the lunar surface from its dual ramps that deployed from the spacecraft. Once on the surface, Luna Cold 1 demonstrated many of the rover technologies that we still are using today, like special lubricants that keep moving parts working at different atmospheric pressures, uh, electric motors, and a radioisotope heater to keep it nice and warm during the cold nights, and solar panels to, that keep charging all the time so it could keep running. This surpassed the previous rovers because it was able to operate for just short of one whole year, traveling more than 34,000 feet and transmitting 20,000 pictures during that time. It also created the modern paradigm for what rovers would be followed for decades, including the Mars rovers. Next, it was time to expand further into the solar system, and the next target would be Venus with the United States and the Venera 7. Venera was a series of probes designed to study the atmosphere and surface of, of Venus. Sorry, through many of the series were ultimately crushed on the way to the surface by the immense pressure, a staggering 93 times that of Earth. Venera 7 entered the atmosphere on December 15, 1970, jettisoned its landing capsule, which this time made it all the way to the surface for a successful soft landing via aerodynamic braking and a parachute. The capsule extended its antenna as designed, and beam signals back to Earth for 35 minutes before suddenly going silent. Then, mysteriously, another 23 minutes of very weak signal were recorded from Venera 7's lander a few weeks later. It was the first, first man-made spacecraft to successfully land on another planet and transmit data back to Earth, clearing the way for the next great feat, landing on Mars. This is amazing! Now, the Soviet Mars program was a string of mixed successes and failures launched between 1960 and 1973 in an attempt to put unmanned spacecraft in orbit around and on the surface of Mars. The closest success came in December of 1971 with the Mars lander missions. Some found orbit but failed to soft land their descent modules, some missed orbit completely, but Mars 3 should be recognized for making the very successful, very first successful soft landing on the Martian surface even if the mission lasted all of 20 seconds. Give credit where credit is due. After the failure of the identical Mars 2 mission it, to soft land descent module just a few days prior, Mars 3 managed to put its descent module on the proper downward trajectory, atmospheric braking, parachutes, retro rockets, all combined to slow the lander down, and after a four and a half hour descent, it landed in the middle of a dust storm, Mark Watney style. No one can be sure, but Michigan controllers speculate that these storms were the reason the Mars 3 lander was only able to establish a line of communication with Earth for just 20 seconds before its instruments stopped working. Mars 2 and Mars 3 orbiters, however, continued to ring around the planet for the next year, returning a wealth of topographic and atmospheric data, so the missions were not a total loss for the program. And Mars 3 proved that with a little better luck, the Martian surface was within reach of robotic spacecraft. For space travel, those odds are well worth the effort. The first really successful robotic exploration of Mars came with the United States in 1976 when the Viking 1 and Viking 2 spacecraft launched the year before. Each successfully deposited their landers on the Martian surface via soft landing. The orbiters continued to orbit, measuring atmospheric water vapor and thermally mapping the planet in infrared. On the surface, the landers took 360-degree pictures of the Martian surface, they took temperature readings, analyzed soil samples, and otherwise gave planetary scientists just the bulk of their body of knowledge for the Martian geology and geography that would serve them for the next two decades. Unlike Mars 3, uh, these missions were not short-lived. The entire Viking program wasn't shut down until May of 1983. The Viking 1 lander operated for more than six years on the Martian surface, and even only then, stopped working because of human error during a software update that caused parts of its communication programming to be overwritten and terminating its link with Earth for good. That's incredible and really horrible at the same time. Ladies and gentlemen, that does it for part one of our two-part series on the history of rovers. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you liked this. If you did, please click the subscribe button. Please click the like button. Leave a comment. Let me know what you thought. And Next video will cover uh, from the 90s onwards, so spirit, opportunity, curiosity, all the crazy cool things that we're doing on Mars now are going to be covered. So guys, if you like it, again, thank you. 
thanks to our patrons on Patreon for supporting this channel. Uh, check it out. Check out the other videos. Thank you very much for watching. We'll see you next time on Space Force.